Okay guys, <clears throat> this is not how I usually start out a video. I'm actually not even ready to be filming right now. I was um, in the process of getting ready to film. Like, <clears throat> I just got home, I worked for a little bit today, and so I was like gonna refresh my makeup and um, I had my notes, like you guys know, my system of, of doing things. And I came home and my house was a little messy. So like a normal person does when they come home, I started to pick up the house a little bit, like put dishes in the sink, you know, stuff like that. And I was walking and all of a sudden I got this like weird warm sensation. That's all I can really explain it as is like a warm sensation going down my hand. And um, it's kind of gory, so I don't mean to um, gross anyone out, so I won't show it in detail, but <clears throat> I cut my finger <laughs> mysteriously. I, I don't have, I wasn't holding a knife. Um, I don't know how this cut happened. Um, it's bleeding really badly. In fact, it's a very deep cut. Like, I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm not a wuss when it comes to cuts. Um, it's a really deep gash and it's a perfect slice. And I can't get it to stop bleeding. This literally happened out of nowhere, take in mind. Yesterday, I went to um, Zach's museum. I haven't had anything happen all night. Um, so it's not like I suspected I got followed home. I really didn't. Um... I wonder if I picked that up on audio. It sounded like, um... I hope I got that on audio. I can't really explain what that noise was. It was almost like static, I guess. Like, like if static were to sound like that's what I thought I heard. So hopefully I got it. If I am, if I did get it, I'll I'll replay it now. So not only do I have this huge gigantic freaking gash, guys, on my finger, and I swear to you, I was not holding a knife or anything. I don't know what happened. Um if it doesn't stop bleeding within the hour, I'm not gonna be able to film and I'll probably have to go to the ER to have stitches put in. Now the other weird thing that happened is I thought I had lip gloss. Was that like a whistle?
I don't, I hope I got that on audio if I did. I don't know, I think it was a whistle. Anyway, I thought this was my lip color. Like, I need to take this off and like redo it because it was a long day, you know, the day you wear your makeup off and you have to redo it. So I thought I had lip gloss on my neck. No, it's not lip gloss. It is a like, it looks like a freaking welt. To be honest, the width of it, like you see like there's a line here and then like a line here, like obviously I wouldn't injure myself, obviously. Especially in the field of work that I do, I'm not gonna freaking go injure myself and then get questioned on set like I have domestic abuse issues or something, but um, I thought that was lip gloss and Blake was like, holy crap, it's like a welt. This is like a blood, blood blister that it has welted up. It literally, you guys, it looks like I got whipped with like a belt. I swear to you guys, I keep hearing whistling in my studio. Like, I hope I'm not making this up. But it seems like it's only when I'm talking that it will happen. Anyways, I just wanted to come document this. I'm not making this up. I don't know where I got a cut from. It's still bleeding. Um, I have what looks like a belt slash, like, mark on my neck. It was, like, welt and two scratches. Oh my god, there's one behind my ear. Can you guys see that? There's one behind my ear. I'm documenting this. It's the day after I got back from Zach's museum. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to stop anyone from actually going to his museum. I am just documenting what happened. Um, I do believe something was in the car with me when I left because something was kind of poking me in the back, which I want to talk about later when I'm like together and ready to actually film. I'm sorry I'm doing this weird. Um, I know this isn't usually the way I start out my vlogs, but this literally just happened. Like, <laughs> this literally just happened. And um, I wanted to come in and share it with you guys while it was happening. So um, I'm gonna go check on my finger. I'm gonna see if I'm gonna need some stitches. I'm gonna see if I can get rid of this horrible markings all over my freaking neck. And then I will be back to um, finish telling you guys about Zach's museum. I'll be right back. So the original plan today was I had an appointment that I had to go to and I worked for a little bit for one of my friends on set and I was gonna come home and uh, you know just chill and get ready to film for you guys. That was that was the original plan. So the turn of events was I came home, I was tired from the work day, um, I made some food, and then I had had my cell phone, I was texting some friends, and then my cell phone, like, vanished. I, I couldn't find it, which didn't make any sense because I hadn't really left, like, the main living area, if you know what I mean. Like, I, I hadn't gone into my bedroom or um, the studio, this is the, the new studio space. So I was going crazy, I couldn't find my phone. So then I went I went into my kitchen and I was like, you know what, maybe if I pick up my house a little bit, it was, it was getting a little messy. And so I'm picking up the dishes and I mean, when I say dishes, when I'm just eating by myself, I use like plastic. So it's not like there was all this like fancy chef stuff going on, like nothing like that. It was just like basic plastic cups, plastic plates, plastic, that was it. And I kinda like, I went, I remember I like went, I don't know, you know, like went like, I don't know where my phone is, like to myself, you know? So I, I went like that, put my hands down, and I walked through my kitchen to, basically in like a circle, to do one more like viewpoint to see if, did I misplace it? And my arms were down at my side while I was just, you know, kinda looking around on the counters, and all of a sudden I felt, I felt like warm fluid running down my hand, and I didn't know what it was, and so like I really quick slung up my hand, 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 and realized on the outside of this finger I had this huge gaping wound. Like it was so bad I couldn't get it to stop bleeding for an hour, and then I went into the ER and got stitches, which is why it's just so beautiful now, isn't it? So I knew it was this gaping wound, and I mean like a clean freaking slice. And so like, I, 
I panicked. I'm not good with blood, guys, to be honest. I'm not, I'm not good with blood. Like, for some reason, blood makes me nauseous and dizzy. I don't know why. So, um, I was, like, freaking out because I had, like, there, were, there was blood on the floor. And, like, when I had slung it up to look at it, there was blood all over the, the dishwasher. I, like, slung blood on the dishwasher. So, I'm, like, kind of in a panic and I start retracing my steps. I'm, like, how did I cut my hand? Like, I have no idea. And so, I thought that I had had, like, blood all over my neck which was weird and so I'm like sitting there trying to rub off the blood and realized it looks like I had like two gaping scratches down my neck and inside of it was welted but it was like that thick and it looked like I had been whipped with a belt and it like popped a, a bunch of blood vessels which I showed you guys and then all of a sudden it was like it was like so fast everything happened so fast like I thought I heard whispering in the house I thought I heard whistling in the house and it was like, it just got like really chaotic. So anyway, my hand's bleeding and I'm like, I tried to worry about it myself. It didn't work. Um, and the gash is so deep. It's not like a jagged gash. It's just like a slice. And, but it's very deep. The thing that I am in shock about is that, like if you get a paper cut or if you've ever cooked and like you're chopping and like, you know, everyone's cut their finger once or twice while they're cooking. You almost feel the cut, don't you? Like almost when you're like, oh my God, and you're like, ow. Like when this happened, I did not feel the cut. And it is probably the deepest gash. I've, and longest. I mean, I have five stitches in it. Um, the deepest gash that I've ever had and I didn't even feel it. And so um, my mom came over, she looked in the house to see like, I hope I caught what I thought was the whispers on the camera earlier. I'm so glad I documented it because this is what's crazy guys, okay. So after this all happens, before I've just, you know, this is before I've decided to go to the ER to get stitches, I'm like, all right, I've taught everyone to say the St. Michael prayer, so it's my turn to do it at home. And so I started rehearsing it and like reciting it over and over again. And all of a sudden, literally, the blood vessels are pretty much gone. Like, that one's a little bit there. Um, and then there was one, like, up behind my ear. But generally, that is gone. So the biggest question everyone was asking before this even happened tonight, because technically it's a day after I went to Zach's museum, everyone was blowing me up because I thought I had gotten followed home the first time. And so they were like, do you think you got followed home? Up until tonight, no, I didn't think that I had gotten followed home. Everyone um, that saw my snaps, because I was literally snapping about this as it was happening, um, and then people were like sending me messages on Facebook and stuff. Everyone's like, oh my God, are you so scared? Are you upset? On Twitter, no, I'm not scared at all. I'm not sad, but I'll tell you that I'm mad. <laughs> like I'm pretty mad about it, to be honest. And I'm trying really hard not to be mad because I know that that energy will just output to whatever and it'll continue to grow. It's a lot easier when people tell you that versus when you're going through it at the time. I'm mad because I've been scratched and pushed and I've had my hair pulled before by entities and um, you know, I've tripped and you know, stuff like that, but I've never had something like give me a gaping wound to the point where I had to have stitches. Um, so I'm mad. I'm just really mad about it. I also don't like um, things to mess with my face so that that made me pretty mad like where it looked like I had a whip on my neck that was cool in the meantime I was very excited to um, come home and tell you guys about Zach's museum because I got to see the whole thing I am NOT gonna spoil the whole thing for you guys like I've told you that before and I'm gonna stick to my guns but I will talk about you know when I had been there before it was not complete it was complete now um, and there's some more specific spots that I want to talk to you guys about. Also, a bunch of you guys sent me messages, um, like questions on social media. So I'm going to get to those too. So in the meantime, let's start and talk about what happened from beginning to end when I went to Zach's museum. So initially I went, um, Blake went with me. He came late. Um, so I went ahead and went down early because I didn't know if there was going to be like a wait. I bought tickets, um for the first day. Now let me address that really fast because it's really important for me to address this. The first day Zach's museum was supposed to open was the morning after 
the mass shooting in Las Vegas. To be perfectly honest with you, I am still struggling with it. Um, Vegas does have a few million people, so it's not like it's a tiny little city. It's such a tight community, like I can't even explain it. Um, for being such a large community, it's not. I don't know if that makes sense. Like back in the day, Las Vegas was a small community and I feel like it still interacts that way. Like, like they are very community oriented. There's always fairs going on. Um, they just really like to stay interactive with the community. So um, for something like this to happen, I also want to tell you guys, 99% um, of people in Vegas do not live on the Strip. Locals don't live on the Strip. There are some apartments on the Strip. I used to know one person that lived on the Strip and I, I think that lasted for like maybe 12 months. He didn't enjoy himself. So um, most of, you know, like locals live out like either north or like east on like the Henderson side or the west side or the south side, okay? Basically, if you're a local, it takes you, for, it doesn't matter what direction you're coming from, it's a good 15 minutes to the strip. So it's really not that big. So if you think about that, I'm telling you that everyone that lives in Vegas was about 15 minutes away from where this mass shooting occurred. So that's very, very traumatic for our entire community, right? Or maybe 80%. Let's go with 80% of communities in Las Vegas if you live in a house like I do, or like some of my friends do, they are gated communities. A lot of the townhomes are also gated and so are the apartment complexes. So when I say gated, some of them have just regular security gates that you have to have a code or a opener to get through. And the other ones, like I happen to be lucky enough to live in a guarded security housing HOA community, which means there is security 24 seven, um, you know, at our beck and call that watches, you know, if we get riffraff in our community. So it's really um, weird that Vegas is that way. Like Denver, there's only a couple communities that have guarded gated communities. In Vegas, that's a majority of Vegas. That's what you're going to see. What is the point of living in a guarded, gated community? I don't know. I guess for safety precautions, it, it makes people feel better. Um, it's like very, it's more than neighborhood watch. Like if you need help and the police can't get to you fast enough, if you call security, they're there in like two seconds, like literally. So um, like I said, I'm lucky enough to live in that kind of community that I have security 24 seven. When the massacre started, our security came door to door um, to check on us to make sure we were okay because um, they weren't sure if there was more suspects um, they asked us to stay indoors, you know, for the remainder of the night and they, they gave us like a courtesy call. Um, there were like sirens going off. It was really traumatic. Like, <laughs> um, the people of Las Vegas are amazing people and for 500 plus to be injured and to lose, you know, 59 lives is ungodly. It's completely ungodly that it happened. And I can say this, that heroes were not just our police force and our firemen because they are unbelievable heroes and they, they did amazing work that night. But heroes are also our local Las Vegas citizens. Something a lot of people don't know is that for some reason, I don't know, there is a giant veteran community from our military that lives here. Yes, we have the Air Force Base here. Yes, we have Area 51 here, but it's not just Air Force veterans. There is just a ton of like Marines, Navy, and Army veterans that live in Las Vegas, like the Valley. So what is really cool is you learn this over time when you start to go to like um, local fairs or the events and stuff like that you start slowly running into the same people over and over again and you realize what a big veteran community it is. So there were some regular citizens there that saved lives the night of the massacre, but there was a ton of veterans there that had been trained in like combat action training and medic medical training and they helped save tons and tons of lives. The police force did an exceptional job. They have watched 
you know, massacres happen across the United States. Not only did it relate to Zach's grand opening, which was the day after, but it, it relates to me as a Vegas local. And I've had a lot of a lot of people in my life that, that were affected by it one way or another. Obviously, this affected Zach's grand opening. I felt so bad for him because I can't imagine putting all the time, effort, and money into getting this ready for a, over a year and then something like that happening, disrupting his grand opening, but he did the right thing by closing the first day. And I know a lot of people came out, like flew here from all over the world for the grand opening. So he did decide to open it the second day, which is when I went. So I would just like to dedicate this video to um, the 500 plus people injured and um, the 59 people that, that sadly lost their lives. Okay, so when you get your tickets, you go talk to this guy outside, then you stand in line at Zach's museum. Then they take groups in. I don't know what the biggest group is. I think mine was like less than 10, like maybe eight. I should have counted. So they give you this ticket. This is the ticket that you get. It says, admit one, Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum. Um, and it says a little blurb on the back. It says, Zach Bagan's The Haunted Museum has a strict no video, no audio recording or photography policy which is enforced during your tour. Please do not do EVP sessions while on tour. Warning, this building is known to contain ghosts and spirits and cursed objects. By entering, you do agree that management will not be liable for any actions by these unseen forces. Touching of artifacts is extremely forbidden and will result in immediate end to your tour. Thieves will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law and succumb to angry spirits curses. I didn't even read that. That's pretty funny. All tour guests must sign and understand the Haunted Museum's agreement. Gratuities are not included. All sales final management reserves all rights. So you can and probably should tip your tour guide at the end um, because they're providing you a service, basically. So what the, the first part of the tour is you have to hold up your right hand and you say... I blah 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 promise to not blame the museum or management for any attachments or spirit in or injuries that I get blah 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 and that's it and it, you say I agree and so they're getting your verbal agreement <laughs> that you won't sue them for getting an attachment darn maybe somebody would have uh, paid for my stitches just kidding kind of Okay, so the first thing that you do is you walk outside, you talk about the original owners with the tour guide of, you know, the museum or the building. It was a mansion back in the day. And then you walk to the other side of the museum and you knock on the door and then an innkeeper comes in and lets you in to the first room. So that's where you start your tour. So I am not going to give details about a few of the, most of these rooms. Most of these rooms I'm not gonna give details because honestly, there's a lot to see and it would take too long. Plus, I don't want to ruin it for you guys if you go. So there is kind of this um, big machine, and I'm not really gonna give more details than that, where Zach gives you a personal message as a tour group. You put in a quarter and out pops this little ticket. So everyone in my group was afraid to do it, so I did it. Um, and basically it says Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum. Historic Mansion Oddities Cabinet of Curiosities. And the back says, and this is what the back looks like. So here's the front, and here's the back. So the back says, be very cautious of the red glow under these. Even the police say it's a gateway to hell. Okay, so that's, that's a clue for what you're going to enter. So this is your admit ticket, and then this is the ticket that dispenses from the machine. Not everyone gets this ticket. Only the person that has a quarter that is willing to go up to the machine will get this ticket. So if you guys go, make sure you have a quarter because nobody carries change anymore. I happen to have one in the very bottom of my purse. So these are the two tickets I got to bring home. So that's kind of cool, right? So just wanted to show you guys what those look like. So this is the agreement that you're not going to sue the museum. Um, and this is, you know, kind of a um, curious message that we didn't know what we were in for. <clears throat> we had a group of about eight or ten people, give or take. So Blake was there with me and um, the tour guide and then a bunch of other people. One girl recognized me. Shout out to whoever you were. I can't, I don't know if you gave me your name. I don't think you did. 
um, and I gave you a hug and that was it. And so there was this girl that, that recognized me and then there was a group of, I think three or four um, ladies that were like in their 20s that recognized me and they were deathly afraid to walk up to me. Um, and they were in my group, they recognized me, I could hear them talking. Um, you guys, if you see me out in public, like, feel free to come say, hey, what's up? I'm not gonna come up to you guys because I'm not gonna be like brash and narcissistic. So you guys have to come up to me and like normally I'll take pictures, whatever else. Um, but these girls were like totally afraid to come up to me, um, but they were pretty fun to be around. I kind of felt bad because since the majority of the group knew who I was, they kind of ignored <laughs> the, the tour guide and wanted to follow me because I'm, they all said that they had seen my video about, you know, the last museum one that I did. And I kind of felt bad for the tour guide because I tried to stay back and like let everyone else get involved because I've seen some of it, you know. And like, no matter what I did, if I walked this way to like give them room with the tour guide, they would walk with me. So I kind of felt bad. I felt like they were kind of missing that experience. So finally I just started standing with the tour guide because I felt really bad. I wanted them to like, you know, have a chance to really learn and, and listen about all this really cool stuff that he has in there. Anyway, long story short, if you guys see me, come up to me. Come like give me a hug or something. Like I'm pretty cool. So do you remember in my last video when I said that? That Zach said energy in the rooms shift. Do you remember when I said that? Boy, he was right. He has a, a let's see, I guess casino themed room. I'm not gonna tell, it's more than that, but I'm just gonna say it's a casino themed room. And um, it's obviously haunted. And I got actually, like before it seemed lively, like it almost seemed um, like exciting, like adrenaline, like if you're gonna gamble. But this time I felt scared. Um, so I don't know if it was the energy of the people that I was in the group with because they were nervous or if it was the actually energy of the room. But anyway, I felt scared in that room before I felt like adrenaline, like really excited. The stained glass I talked about, it's not from Europe, it's from New York, but it is from the 1800s, so I just thought I would clear that up. Let's see, the next rooms we went into was Dr. Kevorkian's van, and once again, last time I was happy, like it just felt like positive energy, like a really good vibe. This time I was really sad and like depressed. It was just a really sad, somber room. Once again, I don't know if that was me feeling the energy of the people in the room with me because maybe they felt sad about it, or is it the, the energy of the room? Did it shift? I don't know. I did get to see the skull that Zach removed from his house that he claims pulled him out of bed at like 5 a.m. I did see that skull. He has that set up in this kind of macabre like library set up. I'm not going to talk about the upstairs, but it was finished. Um, there was another hallway that he has some celebrity memorabilia. He did finish that. I went into... Um, Ed Gein's room again and I got sick the same way all over again. I started coughing. I started getting nauseous. I got like really dizzy like that feeling of like um, what is it like seasick I guess is the only way I could like I guess like feeling drugged <laughs> is the only way I could tell you how I felt like I felt like really wobbly like that. And I felt really bad because when the tour guide was talking, I would get so sick, I'd have to like crunch up and like hold it. Like, like I felt like I was gonna be sick. Um, I don't think that is what followed me um, this time, to be honest with you guys. I do think that that may have been an attachment previously. Not this time. This time I think it was something else. So there's all kinds of stuff in between that I'm not going to talk about because I want you guys to experience that. There is two other rooms though that I got to go in um, that I wanted to talk to you guys about, which was the Dybbuk box and Peggy's room. So there's, a, there's several rooms that the tour guide asks and checks if you're over 18 and only you can enter if you want to enter. And um, I did agree to go in the Dybbuk box room and I did agree to go into Peggy's room. Peggy is the doll. Now, if you guys don't remember the Divic box, um, it's supposedly harboring demons. It was on deadly possessions. Um, the guy had buried it 
for many years in the ground and then unburied it. He, the other owner thought that it caused his mom to have a stroke. There's a lot of history on it. I've done videos on it if you're not familiar. I don't really want to bore everyone else that has already has the history down of the Divic box. So now not too long ago, if you guys follow Zach on social media, he had said that while he was away from the museum, the Divic box had opened overnight by itself. He did have it encased in glass at that time, but it was a smaller piece of glass. This time, he has a very large piece of glass and it is surrounded by, um, I think it's blessed salt and sage. So there's two rooms to the Divic box. There is the initial room you walk into, which is has a lot of facts. And then behind that, there's a additional room and that is where the Dybbuk box lays. So if you do not want to encounter the Dybbuk box, you can stay in the first room and not go into the second room if that makes sense. I did want to see the Dybbuk box because I am very curious about it. So I went into the Dybbuk box. Oddly, I didn't get a lot of bad feelings in that room to be honest. I, um, I did notice that it felt very... Uh, fast, I guess is the only way that I can explain it as, like being an empath, it felt like there was um, a tornado kind of going around me. And I don't mean wind, it wasn't like I felt wind and then like my hair was blowing or anything like that. It was like a lot of movement moving fast in there and I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. I did get the feeling that whatever is attached to that box absolutely loves that room. I did get a feeling that whatever it is, it is extremely dark. I'm assuming it's demonic. Um, it did not come around me, but it was very dark and it is in love with that room. The way that it was built, the only way I can tell you that it looks is, it looks like there was regular walls that were painted white and then a second layering um, that was built on the outside that makes it look like wood. And then there's pieces of wood missing. And then they have put illuminating red lights between the wall and the wood. And so it actually looks like you're almost in a room straight out of hell, if that makes sense. Like it is red and it's glowing through this old chipped wood and it looks creepy and it gives you a really good vibe. I told you guys, pay attention when you're in Zach's museum. Not only is it sight and what you're seeing, but it smells. He has created an environment that is that is very um, appeasing to all senses. You're hearing, so listen for music that goes with that room. Listen for sight, for smells, for all that stuff. Um, he has created a total sensual atmosphere for each room. So this room looks like um, since it has like red glowing coming out of it, it looks like it's burning in hell is the only way I can explain it. And that is the room that the Dybbuk box is in. And he not only has it surrounded by sage and um, blessed salt and then um, a glass box that encompasses it, but he also has music playing. So the tour guide warned us before we went in there not to get creeped out because um, there was music playing and it's almost in a whisper and it is a Jewish prayer. And honest to God, guys, the only thing I could think of, you know, cause he's wanting to encompass it in that room. He's trapping it in this room. I swear to you, it was a scene out of 13 Ghosts where they have like that prayer playing and like he encompassed it with all of like the sketching on the walls with like whatever the prayer was. I swear you guys, the Dybbuk box is in a room out of 13 ghosts. I'm not even kidding. Like I was, now if you take yourself away from the paranormal side, the aesthetic side of visually what he has created, once again, is a masterpiece work of art. Like I don't, like inside the mind of Zach Bagans is not just a paranormal investigator, but he is a full fledged artist because he has created this piece of artwork that is very visually aesthetic to the eye and you can see immediately what he is trying to create um, for people that come in and experience this museum. I did not get a creepy vibe in, well, let me take that back. Um, I did get a creepy vibe in the Dybbuk box room, but it wasn't, um, it, the energy wasn't towards me, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't feel like it was out for me. I felt like it has people that it's focused on I don't know who, not really in my group, maybe people that work there, maybe Zach, I don't know. Um, so it was almost like it didn't have time for me. That was just kind of the energy that I got from it. Um, the tour guide did say that over and over again, including herself, 
people are seeing um, an entity in there that that is manipulating itself to look like the Grim Reaper. So it's very tall, very thin, like over six feet tall, and it has a black hooded cloak on. You cannot see its face, you can't see hands, and it moves very quickly, which I found interesting. She told us this story after we were done in the room, and it was after I had felt that energy of just very fast in there. I don't really know if it leaves that room much because I really got a feeling that it loves that room. Like it is comfortable in there and it is like happy with the way it was created to look and, and it feels like it was given a home to, to live there. If anything, I think you should go in there just to see the aesthetics of it. There is incense in there. It's some sort of a, a, a like holy incense. I'm not sure what they had. And it's probably to keep people protected. And then he has a like a donation center kind of thing. So you can give an offering like you would in a church to this demon um, to... Um, basically say thank you for letting me see you here's a quarter or whatever some people leave locks of hair like some people in my group literally would take a couple strings of hair and pull it out and put it in there um some people left a dollar um the basket is quite full do i think zach is taking this no not really i think that this is literally an offering for it to keep peace with the demon I had reservations leaving anything because I didn't want to, to become attached to it in any way. And um, in my mind, for some reason, even if I were to leave a quarter or especially a lock of hair or something else that, that could create that um, umbilical cord theory that I've talked about, and, and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want a direct route to it. So I didn't leave anything. A majority of people in my group did leave something. Okay, so the next room that I went in... Um, is Peggy's room. So Peggy is the doll. I'm not going to show a picture of it because I don't want anyone to get um, scared or creeped out because there is mystery surrounding Peggy that if you look at a picture of her online, um, not in person but online, that um, she will give you a heart attack or harm you in some way, cause a stroke, whatever. And I don't want anyone to get upset with me for showing her picture, so I won't. Peggy is um, what they think to be a demon residing inside of a doll. And although it's a demon, she likes to portray herself as a child. And so they've almost created a childlike play area inside of this room to make Peggy comfortable, if that makes sense. When So once again, before we walked in, um, our tour guide made us, you know, if we're only over 18, you can go in. There are rules with Peggy. You have to introduce yourself. Hi, Peggy. My name is Crystal. Hi, Peggy. Thank you for letting me come in to see you. Have a good day. Goodbye, Peggy. So you have to, you know, introduce yourself. You have to give a statement about why you're there. And then you have to say goodbye to Peggy formally. If you go in and disrespect her in any way or make fun of her, um, that is how you can get injured or harmed by Peggy. There was only a handful of us from the group that went in. I think four of us total went in. I went in first. Blake was with me. He was behind me. Um, and then there was a guy and a girl. I think they were a couple that went in behind us. I went in and I introduced myself. Hi, Peggy. My name's Crystal, blah, blah, blah. Just what the tour guide said. And then last, the tour guide came in and said, Hi, Peggy. I'm blah, blah, blah. I told you I'd bring you back some friends to play. How are you, Peggy? Trying to be very nice to her. Zach has placed Peggy. And once again, might I add, she's a large doll. I guess I didn't realize how large she is. Um, she almost looks like the size of, like, my little doll. Do you remember those, like, in the 90s? I think I had one. So they're, like, um, three or four feet. So, like, she's a kind of a tall doll. And um, <clears throat> I got an instant creepy vibe from it. I'm going to be honest. It's not just the fact that she's a doll. I'm not a doll fan. But um, something about that room didn't make me feel right. I didn't go in this room before. Um, this was the very first room that I had a really crummy feeling in. And <clears throat> I feel like when I walked in, um, you know, I have to be honest and say that my presence is very authoritative. And I don't mean to be authoritative. It's just my energy. 
I tend to walk in and kind of own the room. It's just how my personality is. If you guys were to hang out with me on like a personal basis, I have a very big personality. I'm very much a social butterfly. I like to make people laugh. Um, and you know, I, I'm like kind of the life of the party. I like to bring the room together and, and, and have fun. And I really felt like she knew that immediately about me and just didn't like me. It was like, I don't like you. Like this instant, I don't like you. Um, Zach has placed her inside of a glass box and um, she, she has a rosary. She has a rosary around her neck, which I have mine on today. And um, apparently the uh, tour guide said that she doesn't like the rosary. So I'm not sure what kind of evidence that they have captured um, with Peggy and the rosary but apparently she does not like the rosary. So here's where things start to get interesting. So I was respectful, as I've told you guys, to they are not in your house, you're in their house, so respect them. So I was respectful to her, I just think that she didn't like me, I just had that, I just knew it, I just had this energy of like, she just doesn't like me, I don't know if it's because I'm a female, I, I, I don't think that's it, I think she just doesn't like me. So um, immediately when I walked out, we had one more exhibit to look at before we walked back downstairs. And all of a sudden, my neck on this side, which oddly happens to be the same side that I had that whip mark earlier, but it was down here like by my collarbone, like in this area, I just was on fire all of a sudden. And it wasn't the kind that itched, it was like burning. And so I had pulled my shirt down right here and Blake was like, oh man, you're just like on fire. It looked like I had been scratched and it had welted up. It was not bleeding. It was not bleeding when it happened in the museum. I'm going to refer back to this later. Okay, so let's just bookmark this in your mind that um, I've immediately had crummy contact with Peggy. I didn't do it. She didn't like me for whatever reason. So I'm going to refer back to this later. Continuing on, you know, through the Haunted Mansion, there's several more exhibits to see that I'm not gonna tell you guys about. There is one thing um, that I do want to chat about. I feel a little bad for spoiling this for people. So if you feel like you're going to get spoiled by what I'm about to say, then maybe fast forward about two minutes or so from here on out and I'll give you a, t a second to do that. The spoiler is, is that I have the answer to everyone's biggest question about Zach. The question is, why did Zach tear down the demon house? Does anyone have an answer? Well, I do. He tore it down because he has part of it inside of the museum. Do you remember the clue that I read in the beginning? Be very cautious of the red glow under these, which are stairs, even the police say it's a gateway to hell, and it has a little demon head right there. The very last exhibit is the demon house, and once again, you have the option to go in or not. I did take the option to go in because I was in shock. Like, I couldn't believe it. Um, I was so excited about it. Everybody's wanting to know about it. I don't want to share with you guys what was inside of there because I will, I will spoil it. I will totally spoil it for you. I will say that part of the house is in there, obviously not the whole house. Um, very key pieces of the house are in there. The tour guide told us that she basically gave us a little story of the demon house and Apparently, the woman that was living there with her children um, was acting very strange and her children were acting very strange. So CPS, which is Child Protective Services in Indiana, got involved and they were actually planning on taking her away from her kids um, because they wanted to interview them and make sure they weren't being abused or coached to say things. So when the police and CPS and doctors or nurses we're inside of the hospital. Don't quote me exactly on this, guys. Like, this is coming from a tour guide, not from Zach himself. But I'm still going to tell you what she said to us. She said that one of the kids was being interviewed. While he was being interviewed, his eyes rolled into the back of his head. He started speaking in tongues. 
and he started walking backwards up a wall and he went up about seven feet and out of nowhere dropped off the wall seven feet high. Um, I'm not sure how old the kid was. I want to say eight or ten and it fell onto the ground and acted like nothing happened. And that was when police, fire, doctors, nurses got involved and said this child is possessed. So that is why the demon house is so haunted. That's just one story, she said. I have not heard that story before. So if you guys have heard it, I'm sorry, I'm repeating it to you, but those of you out there may not know that story. And since it came from the tour guide, I wanted to share it. So the tour guide says if you're over 18, you can enter. Um, but the way the room is set up, if you don't want to be a part of the demon house, you have to turn away and look away. Of course, your girl right here is first to go in, right? I should have smart tattooed across my forehead because, I don't know, maybe sometimes I'm not that smart. So I went in. I was like, oh, I gotta see this. I gotta see this. And all I will say is not only does he have parts of the demon house in there, he also has parts of the land. Of course he does. It's Zach Bagans. Um, he has part of the land inside of this room. So even if it wasn't, you know, the house that was haunted itself, he has parts of the land. So don't worry, he has all pieces. Um, I didn't get a good feeling in here. He has replicated part of the house. Um, it made me nauseous. It made me sick. It made me feel like I was spinning. Um, but once again, I feel like not only these parts are authentic to the house, but he has replicated other parts. They love it. They love whatever, however it's been built, they love it and they stay in there. And I say they because there is definitely more than one and they love that room. And I think that that is the most amount of dark energies I have ever been around in one place, if that makes sense. I did sadly miss the visual. He had a Las Vegas visual outside for everyone that, um, you know, wanted to be a part of, you know, the community and coming together and mourning the loss of the massacre. Unfortunately, I missed it because I was still inside of the museum. I think that the tour ended up taking like an hour and 15 minutes or maybe a little bit longer. So it was quite a while. That's how large it is. It is as great as I expected it to be. Um, in fact, my mom's wanting to go down there. I don't know after tonight if I'm willing to take her or not. Um, we were talking about going again next week, but uh, this whole thing happened and I'm not really sure how I feel about it. So Aaron was there, like I told you guys. He was greeting people in the beginning. He was also greeting people as they left, so I got to say hello and goodbye. And um, I had to park a little bit far away so Blake had actually dropped me off at my car and then he left and then I was there by myself. And I was sitting in the car, you know how you get situated in the car, right? Like you get your your phone plugged into your iPod cord and like you get your seatbelt on, you know, you just get situated. I was getting situated and I, I was by myself in my car and like I'm getting ready to, you know, start the car and go. And all of a sudden in my back on this shoulder, which would have been the middle console area, I start feeling this little light poking on my shoulder and it was like slow and it would be in different spots and it happened like four times. The first couple times I'm typical like you guys like did I really feel that? Was that really happening? And then by the fourth time I literally was like oh hell no and I was like I started reciting the St. Michael prayer. Um, but it, to be honest with you, it felt like a child was trying to get my attention. I will say it again and I will continue to say it, which is unfortunately I don't trust child spirits because that is a way for them to make you trust them. And I did not trust that this was a child considering all of the dark um, artifacts that he has inside of the museum. And guys, I swear the first thing I thought about was Peggy the doll. It just it just went there. Like, I don't know why. It was like a natural. And I was like, oh man, like, she just doesn't like me. I don't know what happened. And uh, I, I did the St. Michael prayer in my car and stuff. And then I felt good enough to drive. I didn't have anything happen last night um, until today. Until um, So that is the only thing that I can conclude um, that's connected is that this injury is from Peggy. I don't know why she doesn't like me. 
Um, no, I'm not sad. Everyone's like, are you scared? Or are you sad? No, I'm mad about it, to be honest. I'm really mad because I don't like dealing with stuff like that. I have been through some tough times. Like, Jerome was one of the scariest areas that I've been to investigate because there's a lot of dark stuff that's been summoned in that old hospital. And I've never had an injury where I've bled for an hour. So um, this is definitely the biggest injury that I've had. I've obviously never had an injury um, that uh, caused me to have to go to the ER and get stitches either. Okay, so now I wanna get to um, some of your questions and answer them for you. Okay, was there anything that really surprised you in a positive manner about the museum? Something that you weren't expecting? Yeah, I was really shocked about um, the Demon House being in there. I had, I had no idea. Nikki asked, did you follow? Did anything follow you back home? Um, I mean, I mean, I'm not making this up. I'm pretty upset about it. <laughs> um, I'm not happy about it. That's for sure. Um, nothing had happened, like I said, the last few days, um, until this, and I just, I don't know what to say. I've never had anything like this happen before, and I'm just grumpy about it, really. Like, you just, nobody wants to deal with this. Like, like, as much as I love paranormal, I have a life outside of paranormal as well, and, um, when something injures you to this extent, and, like, I, I really didn't have time to go to the ER tonight, you know? Like, that's not something people are just hanging around waiting to do, and, I didn't have time to like have this stupid stressful situation so I'm more mad that it took time away from my regular life um, you know than, than anything else if you could investigate anywhere in the world where would it be and why I live in the UK and we have a lot of haunted locations is Josh Gates destination truth legit on Travel Channel he had some ghost hunts and they've been pretty neat just don't know if they were real yeah Josh Gates I think is really legit um, he likes really, really raw stuff, like climbing down a volcano, and that scares me, so I, I really have hats off to him. He has gotten to go to Suicide Forest, which I think is really freaking cool. Um, but yeah, Josh Gates is one of my favorites as just a well-rounded person that likes to investigate the unknown. So yeah, he's, he's one of my favorites. <clears throat> have, have you ever regretted any of your trips, um, and going to a haunted place and... Have you ever been to the Sally House or the Ed and Lorraine's Museum? Um, the one investigation that I do regret, and I've talked about it before, is um, Paranormal Challenge in Jerome. And I regret that because it was a game show, essentially. Like, it's a reality show, and the only way to win, I thought, was to provoke and try to upset the energies so that they will communicate with us and... I'm really lucky that they didn't show some of the footage because I was kind of an a-hole and um, I was disrespectful. And so when I had gone back to Jerome the next time, I did apologize um, to the energies for acting that way because I had a really bad attachment that night from provoking. And that's the last time I provoked and I, I don't plan on doing it again. So yes, I, I really regret um, provoking. But then again... I won Paranormal Challenge with Aaron and Garrison from it, so it's like a it's like a double-edged sword. Like I don't like what's good is bad and bad is good, you know. So I have not ever been to the Sally's house, and I've never been to Ed and Lorraine's museum. I wanted to go do one of Lorraine's um, dinners, but she just announced this year that she was retiring, and I think one of her nephews is taking over the museum, which I was really sad about because I think she just turned 90 or 91. Um, so I hope that I get to meet her someday. I think that, um, the Warrens are really awesome people. They were very, um, progressive in a time that Ghost Gear didn't exist. Um, are you afraid of something following you home? If I were to ever go back into Zach's museum, basically this is like when I was talking about, um, it on the other video. Just because I went to the museum and something followed me back, that isn't a shocker for me. Um, I'm shocked that it was to the extent of an injury that it was um, because I wasn't really planning on dealing with this tonight, but I'm not afraid. Um, I'm not sad. I'm not scared. It makes me more curious about the other side and finding more answers, not just for me, but for you guys on how they can do something like this and how they can cause a welt to look like a belt and 
how they can pop blood vessels in my neck like earlier and so really um, when things like this happen it just makes me more curious about the other side and it just makes me realize how much further we have to go to to research and understand what that realm is man I just had like a super drop in energy like I don't know if it's from having to deal with this tonight or what but I'm just like I just got really tired <clears throat> and I still have to smudge my house and like you know do you guys have any more questions for me about the museum or anything else that I'm willing to answer make sure you comment below PS as a last minute thing I did get a bunch of souvenirs from Zach's museum so I have like some magnets that are like this and I have just some regular stickers and I have a couple of like weird postcards and a bunch of other stuff. It's just like made out of wood. So surprise giveaway for Zach's Museum. If you guys want um, one of these items, there will only be one giveaway this time. Basically, I'm going to put these all in treat bags and just grab a random treat bag and send it to you. I will complete um, the giveaway at the end of every week for the start of the new giveaway. So let me look at the date for you guys. So today is the 5th. I'm going to have this up by tonight or on the 6th. So this giveaway will end on October, Friday the 13th. I will announce the winner on Friday the 13th. So the last day to enter will be Thursday, October 12th. And I will have another giveaway on Friday the 13th every week this month. Please give me ideas on what you guys want to talk about next. Make sure you give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, and I will catch you guys next time.